Good morning, guys. Good morning. Saturday morning. Congratulations uh, to all of you for taking the first step to uh, entrepreneurship and the adventure that comes with it. I guess being an entrepreneur is is an adventure, and um, and as you can see from my adventure, uh, you don't really know where it's going to take you. So gone are the days of you know, going to school for something and getting a job in that thing and then working at a company for you know, 30 years or whatever. I did an undergrad in computer science. And then I fell into the e-health industry, which was uh, which was great, actually. Uh, e-health was exciting and new and hair on fire and you know, bleeding edge type stuff, trying to improve healthcare, trying to increase efficiencies, trying to uh, improve patient outcomes, and, and, uh, and really trying to prevent the healthcare system from falling apart when the baby boomers get there. And it's coming. Uh, unfortunately, in e-health, um, well, I did the computer science thing. Long story, I was registered in Humber for guitar and somehow in computer science for Ireland. Long story. Then I did the, I didn't like technology for what technology is. I liked the application of technology into the real world. And that's where the health thing really uh, appealed to me. So trying to get out of computer science, trying to get out of this technology box that I was in, I did the PMP. And then that wasn't far enough. So then I did an MBA. Uh, part time. The MBA really changed um, my life. It changed the way I, I can, uh, my approach to everything really. Um, so with the MBA, I started doing other things. I started teaching at Ryerson. I started doing, you know, just stuff that I found interesting on the side. And I've always been an entrepreneur, so I was at least all kinds of startups and tech support companies and things while I was, while I was going through school anyways. Um, so in teaching at Ryerson, um, you know, I, I started to uh, relive the fundamental concepts of marketing, relive, retell the, the, the brand strategy, re, re, uh, relive it, really. And at the same time, I opened a restaurant with my, my friend and, and chef, uh, Sean Smith, and we opened the Two Dogs Barbecue thing on, on uh, uh, King West was our first location. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that, but the interesting thing <coughs> about Blue Dogs is we opened just me and Sean and a couple credit cards that were very, very, very maxed. And uh, then we had to survive. And survival for me was, in 2009, how do we get people from the street down into our basement to try our barbecue? So social media was a, was a survival uh, tactic for me. And it was the interesting timing because in 2009, nobody else was using social media yet for a business. Now I had the opportunity with the tools to do stuff, you know, with the marketing uh, fundamentals and the technology knowledge and everything like that. But the marketing fundamentals were really good. How do you engage with the customer? How do you how do you differentiate yourself? How do you brand what you're doing? What matters to you? So that's a little bit of my background. In doing the social media thing, it was interesting because then I was a social media expert. I was a, I don't know, I just became an expert. I was the guy who did it. I was the guy who did it first. In doing that, I had lots of other small businesses and clients asking me for help for one way or another. Um, so I started helping all kinds of different companies, just all shapes and sizes. And I, I got very close relationships with the Toronto Blue Jays. And given that, I started doing some personal brand presenting for Greg Zons and clients from Roger Sportsman, and Eric Thames, uh, Toronto Blue Jays, who now plays in Korea. So I manage his brand and sponsorship in Korea, which is, as you can imagine, uh, pretty ridiculous uh, and, and exciting and adventurous and all that stuff. I mean, it's just so fun to be able to, to do brand strategy both for businesses, small businesses, but also for uh, individuals. Personal brand goes as far, if not more valuable, than business brand. Personal brand and business brand are, are the same parallel, really. It's about understanding who you are. Who you are, what makes you different than the person beside you. And then you take that, that nugget of information. Once you understand what makes you different, what makes you valuable, in, in, in a different way than anyone else. And then you amplify that. That's what brand strategy really is. You amplify what makes you different, what makes you special, what makes you valuable. 
And that same concept applies to business, right? So, by the way, uh, before I go on too far, <coughs> I did do a TED talk on specifically building brand and the power of social media. And so if you want to look that up, just Google brand and the power of social media, you'll find that. So in 2009, I opened a restaurant, like I said, with my chef partner, Sean Smith. We did a bunch of stuff. We you know, tried to survive. We lost a lot of money in you know, the first three, four years. Then it was survival. And I, did, I had to learn to do everything I can to bring people in, to establish those networks, to establish those communities. And, and the word of social media is to engage, to engage with your audience. When you engage with your audience, then you are basically touching each and in every individual that interacts with your brand. You're creating a relationship with these people, which then builds brand champions. And that's really the whole point, is to is establish brand champions. Because the, the brand, and the fascinating thing with brand, is brand exists only in the mind of the consumer. Brand is an intangible asset, and I'll talk more about that, but it doesn't exist anywhere except in the mind of the consumer. So the more people that think the same thing about you or your brand, the stronger your brand. That's really what brand is, and that's the most fascinating thing about brand. Why? So this is Ludo's Barbecue in one slide. It was important for me to have the music play because it is part of the band. We're a very, very, very music-centric business. We do a lot of barbecue. We drink a lot of bourbon. We live the brand. We are the brand. This is what we do. This is what we do different than everyone else. So I'll quickly take you through Ludogs, and then we'll go from there into the more brand-specific stuff. So we opened Ludogs, and it was a crazy, crazy experience. I. I mean, Sean and I were literally Googling how to build a wall and then going to Home Depot and building the wall the next day. And in this ridiculous build out phase, I remember coming home one night and I was still working my corporate job at the time. You know, take the suit off, put the jeans on, go to the restaurant, do construction until 3 or 4 in the morning, come home, shower, I'm all wired, can't sleep. I pull open the laptop and I type this in in like 40 seconds. I typed it out and I sent the first email, because we got our email set up that day, I sent an email to Sean and myself, and then I went to sleep. And the next day Sean's like, what the hell is that? I'm like, I don't know, I feel like I, I thought that we needed something. You know, we're here we are in build out phase or whatever, but I took 25 seconds at four in the morning to type this out. Lid Dogs Barbecue will offer high quality, fast, fresh, affordable, and delicious food options to a diverse clientele. Our goal is to introduce true Southern barbecue and the warmth of Southern culture to as many people as possible. That just came up, and I clicked send. And what fascinates me, and what I'm so grateful for, the ability to be able to teach every term for six years. Every term, I show this slide to a new class. And every term, it still applies. It was like, this is six years ago. How in the hell, I can't believe this thing works. Still, at this point now, we're at the point where we're opening our first franchise in Hamilton, and this still applies. And, you know, it's about, and that's where I, I, I you know, always focus on, it's you. You are the brand. You are the brand in your company. And then you build a corporate culture that aligns with you and your brand. And the people that do that best, we're talking to Richard Branson, we're talking to Steve Jobs, these are the guys that just live, they just are who they are, they do what they do, and they surround people, they surround themselves with like-minded people. And it amplifies the brand. And the more people they touch with the product, service, corporate culture, whatever, the more people understand who you are and what you do. So understanding who you are is what I'm really focused on here. Our Blue Dogs uh, offering is a little bit different in that we, well, it, we do, again, in, in being able to teach, I get to revisit these things. And I say, okay, well, Blue Dogs Barbecue, we do, you know, the $10 ground egg sandwiches to go. We do wings and nachos and pictures of beer and drinks and that sort of thing. We have live music from 10 to 2 a.m. where we have, you know, $3 shots of Jack Daniels. Just seems like something we should do. We have Southern, Southern Barbecue where we have, um, I bring live gospel choirs in for the brunch. We have five dollar mimosas and Caesars for the brunch, and then we have four a.m. late night eats. 
And then we have a whole bunch of catering and stuff, and we're catering lunch today, actually, so catering is a big part of it, too. So what I find interesting is my, I didn't have any knowledge of the restaurant industry before I did this with Sean. So if you look at this, here we compete with, um, you know, any, any to-go burger place or pizza or whatever you have for lunch. Here we compete with the Jack Astors and the Boston Pizzas and the Pups, the Eddie Pub. Here we compete with every live music place in the city. Here we compete with anyone doing brunch in the city. And here we compete with Late Night Eats, Forma, Chinatown, Street Meat. And here we compete with all the catering companies. Now what I find fascinating about that is none of the people I named compete with each other. But somehow we're able to compete with all of them. What we've been able to do by accident is segment based on our, who our consumer is, and then segment again based on the time of the day. What does the consumer, what does our consumer want at lunch? A 10 dollar brown bag sandwich to go. What does our consumer want in the evening? Ribs and a pitcher of beer, wings. What does our consumer want from 10 to 2 a.m.? Three to more shots of Jack Daniels and live music. And what does our consumer want the next morning? Five dollar rolls and six Caesars. And it just happened. So I, you know, I'm not, I'm not claim, I, I'm not claiming to have pulled out a textbook and 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 written it all down while we're, you know, strategizing. This just happened. This just came out of us. This just, it was one thing after another. Well, why wouldn't we have brunch and five dollars Caesars? Why wouldn't I bring a gospel bar? It just seemed, everything I did just seemed like it was meant to be. Now, one thing I will um, point out design, creative team, digital uh, digital design team that worked for us, did I make our first menu. And I'll never forget this, and I talk about this in class a lot as well, I'll never forget, we walk in there, the menu's, uh, the menu looks great. They did, they did the logo, uh, this font is wrong, but they did the logo, they just, they just did, they did the slide deck actually. The great digital designers. Now I want you to understand the difference between a designer and a brand strategy or the marketing strategy, which is what you guys are doing for yourselves. The designer doesn't know what your marketing strategy is. All they know is what you told them. So I tell this brand guy, or this uh, design guy, let me sell the barbecue with any of you. So he pulls out, he makes a menu for us, and does the fonts and whatever, lays it all down, makes it look nice, does what his job is to do. And on the front of the menu, his tagline said, the best pulled pork this side of Mason Dixon line. And I was like, what the hell is the Mason Dixon line? I don't understand. This is too long. I don't get it. And in that meeting, again, right shooting from the hip, I was like, dude, that's way too complicated. Can't we just do like, we serve good times? Like, how's that? Like, does that work? That's it. We serve good times. It's what we do. It's just who we are. And that's the brand I built on. And so what I'm saying is, the designer, the creative person, they're there to make it look pretty. You're there to drive what happens. Do not let, you're the customer, do not let a designer who's great at making it look pretty decide your marketing strategy or your brand. So it's important to understand the difference there. Um, we serve good times, again, it still applies. And we kept adding all those new business areas, we kept you know, doing stuff differently, and everything we do is still in line with we serve good times. So here's our product. You'll be having the brisket and stuff for lunch, a slob, black bean, there's our wings. Again, brand strategy or these little things you can do with your product to set you apart. We found these dry rub wings in Memphis, so my chef said we went down uh, for a little barbecue tour, and I said, Sean, we're gonna do some dry rub wings. And we're not gonna order, we're not gonna offer wings that are saucy. And I'm gonna call the butcher and make sure he doesn't cut this thing. I want this thing to look like it can fly away or flow away last week. And this is a thing. And the best thing would be open. And I was I'm stubborn. And this is what you have to do to be to build a brand, you have to be stubborn. You have to say, this is who I am. And I am not a terrible pub serving frozen chicken wings in a sauce that they get out of a jug. Right? That's not who I am. So for the first year, I would only let the servers sell in the kitchen sell this dry rub. 
bartenders would yell at me, Sean would yell at me, customers would yell at me, can't you just give me like, you know, saucy wings or hot wings? I'd say, no, you can get hot sauce on the side, you can do whatever you want on the side. We serve our wings dry rub. Why did it mean so much to me to have this wing? Or people would always pick it up and they'd be like, what the hell is this thing? How do I eat this? And they would always have the pinky up, like, what? The, the, you, you can't eat this unless you break it. <laughs> Welcome to Ludo's. Hopefully you get some barbecue sauce on your barbecue shot on your on your shirt. Like that's that's what I never ever wanted to be compared to a pub. We never wanted to be compared to a pub. So what did I do to differentiate? I said our wings are real. Like, and, and quite frankly, sometimes there's a feather in the you know, on that outside tip, it doesn't get cleaned up or whatever. It's part of, and, and then socioculturally, I'm okay with that because people are moving towards eating real food again. People all of a sudden want to recognize where their food actually comes from and want to stay away from the process and the chemicals and whatever. So it aligns that. But that's, I did it because I wanted to differentiate. So the more you em emphasize who you are and how you're different than your peers, what you are doing differently, um, and, and how it aligns with your brand personality. That's, that's what this is all about. So in Bulbor, our place, we built one in King West. Uh, you know, we're the guys in King West that would put a blues trio on the sidewalk. Besides, this is Sir Lee's restaurant right here. <laughs> so, again, we serve good times. Put the band outside. Whatever. If you don't like music outside, you're not a good person. You're in King West. So, you know, this was back before King West was King West. And now, we still have always had this, um, this juxtaposition of this, this, this place on King that was the place you could go and be human again. You know, King West is very uppity, and then you go to Ludo's, and you're like, oh, sweet, I can be human again. So that's kind of what we, we build on, is the we serve good times. We're very down to earth, we're very whatever, our, our pricing uh, lines up accordingly. We do a bunch of stuff in the promotion. This is one of the things, one of the ideas that I had to, again, uh, extend the brand into engaging the community. Free stop calendar, I thought to myself, I'm gonna give away something for free every day. I'm gonna post this stuff on social media, I'm gonna post this stuff all over the restaurant, and people will see that on April 26th, they get a free pound of dry rub chicken wings. What do you have to do to get the dry rub chicken wings? You have to follow me on Facebook or Twitter, and every morning, I will tell you what you need to do. So like this one, you have to be there at 5 p.m., and the tweet or Facebook post said, you have to be the first person to stand on a chair and sing and do the chicken dance at 5 p.m. And you'll win a free pound of wings. So when I started pushing this out in King West, oh my, King West designer, you know, creative agency, healthy kind of people were, oh, Lou Dogs, you're so funny, oh, Lou Dogs, we love it, and that was cool. But then when we opened the Ryerson location, near Ryerson University, and then we had multiple students actually coming in and doing it, because students will do anything for free food. So now I have the video capturing people, two people, three people, singing doing the chicken dance. The bartender's calling me saying, there's three people here doing this. What am I supposed I was like, I don't know, make them play paper, rock, scissors, and break a tie or whatever, I don't know. But that's, all of this is not only engaging with the consumer, it's just one idea. You can do a thousand different things to engage with the consumer, but more importantly, it aligns with the brand of Blue Dogs. It aligns with We Serve Good Times. It aligns with, you know, everything that, that we stand for is, is, and everything we do should, everything you do, should align with your brand strategy, with your corporate culture, with the values that are important to you, which aligns or amplifies the things that make you special, the things that make you different, the things that build value beyond what your competitors can do. It's not going to say you're better than everybody else at everything, but you're different in certain ways. And find out what the way is that's most valuable and interesting and amplify it. So brand is a name, term, design, symbol, any other feature that identifies one seller's good from another. That's just the marketing textbook version. A brand is literally who you are, right? Now a brand is, in Ludovic's, is literally created from the best parts of my personality and skills and experiences combined with my chef and partner Sean's personality, skills, and experiences. And together, 
It's the Lou Dog's DNA. And that Lou Dog's DNA is literally my firstborn child. And it grows every day. And every bartender we hire that aligns with our brand extends this. And every musician that we book that plays at Lou Dog's extends this. And every um, party I throw for the Blue Jays, and every party I throw for whoever, and every guest speaker I do, everything I do, everything that happens in and around Ludo's, every customer that comes in, continues to build on the same DNA. We start Ludo's, you start your company, and then where it goes is like a child growing. So you have control over where that grows. You have control over who you hire and what type of product releases you do, and what type of marketing messages you send out, what type of you know interactions you have. And, and all of those interactions are the total sum of your brand. Because the brand only exists in the mind of the consumer. So the brand is who you are. It is who you are. And it's your job, or my job as a brand strategist, find out who that is and amplify it. It's different than everyone else. And again, it's not to say you're better than everyone else or or whatever. It's not about that. It's about being who you are, being different, being unique, adding value in ways, in a combination of ways that others can't do because they're not you. So at Ludogs, our brand is, you know, good food, good music, good people, good times. And, you know, 3 a.m. full pork routines and brisket and live music and stuff. And, and that's just who we are. It's just what we do. So it's a DNA. Now, even the, the Non-profit stuff that I'm involved in with music counts from the Junos and the Toronto Blue Jays um, uh, Jays gear. It's it's in line with what's important to me. It's the same. It's the same DNA. You know, I choose to put my time into giving students music, so keep them out of trouble, and giving them baseball, keep them out of trouble. These are the and like like I said, everything you do, every brand partnership you have, every every collaborator you work with extends the DNA of your brand. So keep that in mind as every every day, every day you live, every everything you do um, extends what that what that DNA was uh, was created, how that DNA was created. So when you build the brand, when people get to understand, and now the reason I put that slide up there with the blues music and everything else is people oh, they're the market of blues place. So it doesn't matter if they're baseball players or if they're musicians or whatever. They're just like oh, that's the market of blues place, right? So, you know, I stayed over the time, I made some friends with the Jays, I did some stuff with George Strombo, we had these other mealtime guys on, I did some Dragon's Den stuff, all kinds of random stuff that just kind of kept happening with a well-defined brand. Would not have happened if it was Daryl and Sean's, you know, hipster barbecue joint with hip-hop playing, right? Tacos and hip-hop are cool for the Toronto media, but there's no brand there. There's no, there's no nothing that makes sense. No, and it could have been Daryl and Sean just opened in a restaurant, right? And playing music and whatever, right? But then they wouldn't have a brand. They wouldn't have a, a personality. They wouldn't have a, a, a leverage for a future. Tacos and hip hop, here today, gone tomorrow. I love hip hop and I love tacos. But there's no brand to speak to, there's no extension. Right, so the brand extensions that I have available to me, Blue Dogs Lager, the Southern Tea with our friends at Jack Daniels, barbecue sauces, anything that we do will continue to build the brand that we've created. And, and in you know six years, you know, it's about just keeping that on the same path, with your same vision. So what makes a brand? A brand is is the name, URL, logo, symbols, characters, slogans, jingles, and sounds. That represents your brand. But you are your brand. That's how that works. And when you specialize, then you realize that the logo is nothing more than a logo. I hated the Ludogs logo the first time I saw it. I thought this was the most ridiculous. I said, what? Like, look at the details, right? What is the hell is this thing? And why is it on a, on a grill? That's not even a southern barbecue. It looks like some brontosaurus kind of bone. I just was not happy with the way it looked. But I was too much into the details. Look at Starbucks. What the hell is this thing? What is it? Why is it there? You know, in, in creating a logo, you would think that it should look more like the second cup logo. With this cup of coffee, and it says some stuff on the outside. Right? That's what you think. 
But this is just a great representation example of the fact that it doesn't matter. You specialize on what you do. You do it consistently. You do every transaction aligned with the last so that you can create the exact same image of who you are with every single person. The consistency in Starbucks blows me away. I don't know how they train the people. I, I, I can't I can't get my bartenders to do stuff. And in Starbucks, I go in there and I say double long espresso and I walk over. And you know, I aired and I don't really feel like chatting or whatever. And this guy behind the counter who's making minimum wage and no tips says to me, Dublio whatever. And I'm like, how do they get him to speak this language that they made up? How does this happen? Do they shock him when he doesn't do it? Like, what do they do? They're not paying him. How do they get the, the minimum wage employee to talk the same talk and do the same stuff? Every single Starbucks um, interaction, every single transaction that's ever happened to Starbucks is exactly the same. And that's what builds a brand. They have a brand that's so strong that globally, they've now dropped the words. You don't need words. Words are for suckers. You need a bad image. This recall will be way faster. And English is not the global language. They're opening in China. They're opening all over the world. And now, think about this. You take these words off. And globally, globally, this thing represents coffee. Back to what the hell is this thing? But now it's our global representation for coffee. This mermaid thing is our global for all of mankind. You see that thing? You're in Asia, you're wherever you are in the world, you see that thing, and you're, you think coffee. Because they built that, and the brand exists in all of your minds. You know, this, this image just represents it. It just triggers the recall in your mind, but it exists in your mind. So the consistency of those transactions really is what creates the brand, right? And that's what gets uh, to a point where it's so strong that it can, it can do with other words. So brand establish loyalty, they protect the competition, they reduce marketing costs, because you don't have to market if you have a good brand. You don't have to market as much. You just have to amplify, right? So brands, and here's where brands, um, you know, brands are the low, logos, whatever. I'm going to focus here. The differential value of knowing the brand and the access paid for a property beyond book value. When I was in the MBA, I learned this thing, this word changed my life called intangible assets. When you value a company, when you do the company evaluation, you are going to take assets, theoretically, sell them, pay off all the liabilities, theoretically. And then you're going to add this recurring revenue line this fancy finance guys came up with to perpetuity and there's like a calculation for that or whatever. Either way, you get the book value for the, uh, the company divided by the number of shares and that's what the share should cost. It doesn't work that way because you have to add this amazing word called intangible asset. Intangible asset. And just to be clear, this is tangible. This is intangible. It doesn't exist, you can't touch it, it's nowhere. But what the hell, it, it, and, and when I say that, a stock would trade maybe book value for $10 a share, but that stock's actually trading for $160 a share. And the rest of that is made up by this magical word called intangible assets. An intangible asset, the biggest intangible asset is brand, brand equity. Which by the way, again, only exists in the mind of the consumer. So the only control you have over brand is to have the exact same transaction with every single person. You do that and you create brand equity. And to get, you know, crazy spiritual on you, if everyone's thinking the same thing, it manifests. So there's, there's something to be said for that too. Brand exists in the mind of the consumer and the more consumers that think the same way, the stronger the brand equity. So brand equity 
And it's about creating the positive attitudes, the reliability, the ability to trust a brand. If you went into Starbucks and they were playing loud rock music and the lights were turned up high and the coffee tasted different and the guy behind the counter had tattoos up to his neck and whatever, it wouldn't be consistent. It wouldn't be reliable. All of a sudden you'd be off here, you'd be like, oh, that was a weird kind of thing, right? The, the best brand reliable transactions happen when you don't think of it. You go through Starbucks, you leave, you, you don't think that was the best thing ever, and you don't think that was the worst thing ever. If you don't think at all, they did their job. Reliable transactions, just consistency all the way through. That's what, that's what builds loyalty. Loyalty between the consumer and the brand happens because of reliability, because of consistency, because you can trust that it's going to be the same every time, which results in positive word of mouth. And the relationship. Now, the relationship is what we're talking about here. So the relationship is your primary source of competitive advantage. It's the primary asset to manage. It is the asset. You have to protect this brand. And I have a thousand stories of being stubborn and protecting that brand and saying, you know, no, dry rub chicken wings is what we do, period. And now, now you can get honey hot or you can get whatever, but um, for the first year it was like, we want to be different. We want you to make sure that you understand. Now people get dry rub chicken wings because they're frankly better than the other ones. So you protect the brand. Um, there is a there is a level of us versus them. Us understand what brand is. We focus on brand, we, we care about brand, we protect the brand. Them, not you know, bad people, not really like my chef is a genius. He's a genius. I can say Sean, we're catering a thousand people tomorrow, he'll make it happen. I don't know how he makes it happen, he just does what he does. When I was a corporate guy, I had to come to the restaurant. And I walk in, and there's hip hop playing. I'm like, Sean, what in the hell is, why is there hip hop in our barbecue blues restaurant right now? I like hip hop. Nothing against hip hop. I enjoy hip hop. I grew up with hip hop. But, and then Sean would say, well, I can't listen to blues all day. I said, are you kidding me? I don't care what you want to listen to. Get back in the kitchen. I don't come to the kitchen and squirt pulled pork or squirt mustard on your pulled pork. Don't come to my front house and mess with my brand. You know, and, and this has happened, and that was in King Street, and then when we opened Ryerson four years later, I walk in, he's listening to Top 40. I'm like, dude, what are you doing? Well, you don't know, students don't want to listen to blues. Students don't want to listen to blues, they want to listen to what they listen to. I'm like, it's not about what they want, they have to walk in here and be immersed in our brand. And then they have to do that over and over again, then they have to expect you walk in the blue dogs and you're immersed in the blues. That's what we, that's how we, so to this day, yes, he'll let me play blues because, you know, he knows I'll, I'll get violent if he doesn't. But uh, he doesn't buy in. He doesn't really understand it to the fact, the fact that it is as important as it is. So you have to protect your brand from people like that. And I'm not saying Sean's a bad person. I'm not saying he's a dumb person. I'm not saying anything. My parents, my parents often say, especially while we were struggling at a restaurant, you should sell samosas. I don't like samosas, you should sell samosas. <laughs> like, what the hell? <laughs> they're just, not, again, they just, they think people are coming for food. If you have other food they like, they'll buy it, whatever. There's a, there's a, there's another location, there's a, a Ryerson location, the Church of Gerard, and, and Gerard, um, Church of Gerard, two doors down. When we used to go to Ryerson, we lived in Neil Weizak, couple doors down from there, and there was this pizza place. And the pizza place was great. It was called like Love at First Bite. And it was like a New York pizza place and you know we had this big New York style pizza and behind the counter was this New York style pizza guy who had pasta sauce on his you know apron every day and he was that guy. Like his name was Luigi or something. He was just that guy. So it was a great pizza place. We went there all the time. He all subs. We went there all the time. We come back uh, to open the dog's virus and I say Sean is that pizza place still there? He says yeah so I go next door I walk in there, nice Asian couple about it. Pizza's still on the counter, so that's where I remember. I look up, the menu, she's serving that Thai. And all kinds of Asian dishes. And pizza. And they have beer. And it's just the most random mishmash of like, what the hell is this place? They destroyed the brand, they diluted the brand. By trying to be all things to all people. Which happens, it can happen. Bartenders used to call me in King West and say, look, there's nobody in the restaurant. I have a table of 10 that's here. 
they really want to put their own iPod so that they can drink $3. I said, just think about this. Yes, it's a table of 10, and yes, they're going to drink. But if we give them their iPod, and they drink our three or four dollar drinks, they're just drinking before they go to whatever nightclub they want to go to. They're not being exposed to the Lugans brand. Yeah, you might. So when you start to compromise your brand to try to satisfy everybody, you're now diverting. And every time you dilute, you can never recover from that dilution. So it's protecting the brand is a full-time job. And it makes sense to people like us. And there are people out there that this doesn't occur to. So you have to protect your brand because there will be people that you encounter that don't really care. Whatever, music, music, whatever, food, food, right? Your restaurant, serve this or that, right? Like I said, in the mind of the consumer, and it is what others say about you when you leave the room. So you need to, so when people leave Starbucks, they, they have the same impression of it. When people leave Blue Dogs, they have the same impression of what that is. That is brand. So when you have when you have a brand, you welcome other competitors. The more people that do what you do in a similar fashion, better for the category. And then the people that take brands seriously will rise to the top. So here's there's about two two major brands that will rise to the top in any sort of category. One thing I want to note is you don't advertise to build a brand. You have to build a brand organically. You have to. Once you have a critical mass of an organic brand, then you advertise. And you don't advertise, uh, you advertise the brand that you built. And you don't advertise the features or the functions of your product or whatever, you advertise the brand leadership. Right? So you can't advertise unless you have a brand leadership. You can't have a brand leadership unless you have consistent transactions. See how this all works together? You have to really build it from the ground up, and then you amplify that which you built. So advertise the leadership. So then when you advertise, you don't advertise the product. This doesn't do anything to tell you what Coca-Cola is or what it tastes like. And by the way, think about that. What does Coca-Cola taste like? If one of you can explain to me what Coca-Cola tastes like, I'll give you $100. Like it doesn't exist. Tell me what Coca-Cola tastes like. Think what? You can't without using the word Coca-Cola because the brand is so ingrained in you that you can't use any other word but it for it. Tell me what a Big Mac tastes like. Right? These are the ones, and, and this is why actually I do not, as a restaurant owner, especially at the startup, did not enjoy dealing with Coke. I would love to have switched to Pepsi. Why can't I? Because you try to serve someone a Jack and Pepsi. You're going to throw it in your face. What the hell's wrong with your... There's something wrong with this, and they'll hand it back. How did Coke dominate that industry? It owns that place in your mind. When you get a mixed drink, it's got to taste the way you remember it tasting, and you only ever remember Coke. That's brand consistency. Coke has an incredible consistent product with a global reach. We all know it. So now they don't have to advertise the product, they're advertising the brand. So they're amplifying the brand that already exists in all of us. Um, so the power of a brand is inversely proportional to scope. You cannot let it down. You have to be focused on who you are, focused on what you do, and dominate on what you do. And don't try to be everything to everybody else. So you focus on the brand, you continue to build one day at a time, and you continue to uh, create a consistency across all of the uh, consumers that feel your brand. So again, it's the us versus them. Them, nice people, you know, Sean, genius, chef, awesome, would have a southern, we would have a southern barbecue and hip hop restaurant right now. And I bet you the sad part is Toronto media would be all over it. You know, it'd be good to bear one Toronto, but I can't extend the brand. So, so what I'm saying in that is, it's easy to want to be all things to all people. It's easy to want to please the people in your immediate community. But you have to look further. Now I can extend the brand. We're opening our first franchise in Hamilton. And then London and Kitchener and Guelph and Cambridge. What do they care about when Now Magazine in Toronto cares is the coolest restaurant? Right? I could have I could be playing Drake all 24-7 all day long. And Now Magazine would love it, but the guy. You know, and Kitchener doesn't really care. 
Right? So it's about just amplifying your brand so that you can extend so you don't dilute the samosa thing and then the pizza ties with shawarma. And anytime you go to a restaurant that's serving three or four different things, you don't go there. You have a shawarma place, you have a pizza place, you have a sushi place. When you're trying to push them all together, you don't go there because you, you confuse the consumer. So that's essentially um, the presentation on the brand, the importance of brand. Okay. All right. All right, thank you. Thank you.